Okay, go. Okay. All right. I want to welcome you to the class tonight, and of course we're going to begin this evening in 2 Timothy chapter 2, and from there we'll go to James chapter 1, <clears throat> and we're continuing along with some things that we've been studying for a few weeks and comparing the Pauline epistles with what we'll call, uh, we, we'll call the Hebrew epistles in the King James Bible. And so if you will read with me tonight in 2 Timothy 2 from verse 7, 2 Timothy 2, verse 7, and he said, Consider what I say, and the Lord give thee understanding in all things. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel, wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even unto bonds. But the word of God is not bound. Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sakes, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus, with eternal glory. Come down to verse 15 while we're here in the chapter. And so verse 15, uh, we have Paul admonishing Timothy, and he says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, I have the little thing on the board here that we, you know, this is where we usually begin when we talk about rightly dividing the word. And we, we lay these things out and we separate Romans through Philemon because it's in Romans through Philemon where we find that truth that he's referring to in the passage that he calls my gospel. And if this is all that you can get a grasp on, if this is all that you can get a hold of pertaining to rightly dividing the word, we'll praise the Lord for that because there are you know, thousands of religious people in the world that can't see this or won't. That the scriptures are laid out in such a manner that we can separate the things that are to us and the epistles that Paul wrote to the church, the body of Christ, and see that they differ from these epistles here, which, which we call the Hebrew epistles, and from the things that uh, were referred to in the book of Acts by Luke and the accounts of the Lord's earthly ministry. But I believe that there's something more really involved in what's being said there. In other words, what we're going to endeavor to do tonight is go a little bit deeper. And if, if you're a person who's inclined to not care about things that are precise in the Scripture, then the class might not be of very much interest to you. But uh, I believe that God is precise in this book. And I believe that little words often are very powerful. And so we're going to talk tonight about a few very small words <laughs> I want you to hold on here to 2 Timothy because you notice in verse 15 that there where he refers to rightly dividing the word of truth. I want you to keep a finger there and go back to, go to James that you're holding on to. James chapter 1. The other time that this phrase shows up in the Bible is in James chapter 1, which is of course one of these epistles here. In James 1, he says from verse 16, James 1, verse 16, he says, Do not err, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Well, in comparing these things together, these two passages where we find the word of truth referred to. You see, I believe that it's not just, it's not when he, when Paul said to rightly divide the word of truth, I don't believe he's really saying necessarily to divide up the scriptures. I believe there's something really that's more specific involved and we find here James referring to the fact that there are some people who were begat, were begotten by the word of truth or with the word of truth, he says in verse 18, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. And if we wanted to, we could take the time and compare some things, but you see there was a group of people who were born or begat unto the Lord at Pentecost. I believe in, it might have been the last class, but maybe the class before that, we talked about how that the, one of the things that these epistles point to has to do with the, the, the preaching of the Twelve on the day of Pentecost and the giving of the Holy Spirit where they were 
uh, enlightened and illuminated and, and, and on and on. Well, you see, the word of truth, that I, I believe that what is really meant by the word of truth is the preaching of the resurrection. There were some who were, became the first fruits at Pentecost. In fact, in, in Leviticus 23, I, 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 I won't ask you to turn there, but in Leviticus 23, when where Pente the Feast of Pentecost is laid out, there is a reference to first fruits. There was a first fruits unto Israel that day. On the day of Pentecost, when those people repented and believed at the preaching of Peter in the twelve, and when they heard them preach the resurrection, there were people that were begat by that truth, born unto God, as it were. So you see, I believe that the, in the precise sense of things in the Scripture, the word of truth is, the, is Jesus Christ risen from the dead. He is the he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And so the word of truth is the proclamation of the resurrection, the proclamation that God raised his son from the dead. And if you'll, if you'll notice now, go back to 2 Timothy <clears throat> chapter 2, where the rightly dividing the word is referred to. In verse 8, for example, 2 Timothy 2, verse 8. <clears throat> so he says, Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. Notice he doesn't say just remember that Jesus Christ rose from the dead, the truth, but remember that Jesus Christ rose from the dead according to my gospel. So you see what it's going to, what we're going to find out, Lord willing, we're going to see that the word of truth uh, is preached in more than one manner. The, the word of truth must be divided. There is, there is a preaching of the resurrection in this Bible that Paul said is according to my gospel, and yet there is other preaching of the resurrection. There is other preaching of the word of truth that is not according to what Paul called my gospel. And so those things have to be divided. You see, it's like what he's saying there is there are things that have to be separated in this Bible. And you can't, you are not dividing anything if you're adding you can't add and say that you're dividing. That's, that, that, that just, that's mathematically, uh, con it's, it's a contrary. I don't know what the, the right word to say there is. But you know, there's another way you can divide, and it's by subtraction. Subt if you subtract something, you're dividing it. Well, there, there is a division that is to be made by the man of God in preaching the word of truth. And so, as I say, I want us to look at some simple words that, that, make a, that are very, very important. And of course, you notice that there's one of these simple words is that word that's up there in verse 8 that Paul, refer, he refers to my gospel. Look in chapter uh, 1 of 1 Timothy. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 1. <coughs> In 1 Timothy 1, and verse 11 there is where we're, what we're looking for. 1 Timothy 1, verse 11, he says, According to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. Well, the gospel that Paul says is mine, and of course, again, there's some things that I want to use the time to cover, and I don't want the class to be two hours long. We could take the time and go into the details about Paul's gospel. But I suspect that anybody here that's here or anybody that's watching wouldn't be watching if they didn't have some idea what Paul's gospel was in the first place, which, of course, it is the good news that Christ died for our sins, was buried, and rose again. No one before Paul ever knew why Christ died. And that's the mystery that was revealed to Paul. <clears throat> the twelve knew that Christ had died. They knew that God had raised him from the dead. They did not know why he died. And that is the mystery 
that Paul says was revealed to him alone. It was according to a secret that was kept, um, the mystery that was kept secret since the world began. <coughs> and the, the basic fundamental truth of that gospel that Paul says is mine is that God justified some people by Jesus Christ's uh, death. His burial and His resurrection. That there, could, there were going to be some people who were going to be justified by faith in what He did. They were going to be justified by something that happened in the past. Rather than something they were going to do, looking forward to being justified by their works in the future, you see. That is the, the essential truth of that gospel that Paul says is my gospel, is that God would justify people by faith without them doing a thing. With it, that He would justify them by grace, through their faith, without works. That is the essential truth of that gospel that He says is mine. In fact, I might use a different color up here so we can keep things separate. So, I'm going to put that word up here. Paul said, my gospel, of course, and it's the gospel of Christ, you know, the, the mystery. I might put that up there. My. And you notice there, he said it was committed to my trust. Now, my is singular, right? Not, not plural. It's singular. Little word, but rather powerful. Mine. Nobody else. I want you to go to Romans chapter 1. <clears throat> go to Romans 1 and take 1 Thessalonians 2. Romans 1 and 1 Thessalonians 2. And maybe I need to, to mention this too before we go any farther, that I believe that if you're going to be saved today, that you're going to be saved by this truth. That you're going to be, that salvation today is by trusting Jesus Christ, believing that when He died, He paid for your sins. That that's, that's the essential truth of this gospel. It's about being justified without works. It's about, like as they say, quit trying and start trusting. Rely upon Christ, believing that He died for your sins. I don't believe in preaching any other truth for salvation. That is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth today. As Paul referred to it in Romans 1, even though when he said that in Romans 1, we wouldn't have heard that truth. But it's being made known unto all men today. So that's, I don't want anyone to misunderstand by anything they might hear on the video or any of you here that, that I believe in preaching anything any different than that for salvation today. That's how God saved me, and I believe that's how God will save you, or, and, and, and that we're all, anyone who is saved is saved by trusting Christ based upon the good news that He died for all men, which is the message today. And yet there, there is this other uh, more... Uh, elemental truth that is referred to here and we're going to read about. And it's in Romans chapter, we're going to start in Romans 1. <clears throat> in Romans 1 verse 1. Romans 1 verse 1. It's, he says, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Concerning his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the Spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. Now if we stopped there and we looked at each verse carefully, took, got a magnifying glass and looked and read every single word, is there a mention in there of his death being for sins? No, it isn't, is it? In other words, the gospel of God is not exactly the same as the gospel of Christ. There, you can't preach the gospel of Christ without telling people that Christ died for their sins. And yet there was a message that was committed to some men to preach that had to do with making known that God had declared Jesus of Nazareth to be the Christ, His Son, by the resurrection from the dead. In other words, the proof from God Himself that Jesus was the Christ is the fact that God raised Him from the dead. 
and that these things had been promised before in the Old Testament Scriptures. That's exactly what he says in there. So then, if we just let words mean what we say, uh, what they say, then we know that there is a gospel in the Bible, a good news, that's referred to as the gospel of God, and it is the proclamation that God declared Jesus of Nazareth to be the Christ by the resurrection from the dead. Now, uh, turn with me to 1 Thessalonians 2. And I want you to read there with me from verse 1. 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 1. And so he writes there and he says, For yourselves, brethren, know our entrance in unto you, that it was not in vain. But even, even after that we had suffered before and were shamefully entreated, as you know, at Philippi, we were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. Now, you notice he's referring to our entrance in unto you. That is, the first thing you heard from us when we came to you was the gospel of God. That is what we came making known, that God had declared Jesus of Nazareth to be his son by the resurrection from the dead. So he said in verse 3, for our exhortation was not of deceit, nor of uncleanness, nor in guile. But as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God, which trieth our hearts. Now there's another little word. We. We is not singular, is it? <laughs> we, we is plural. In other words, the gospel of God is the gospel that he's referring to. And he says, we were allowed of God to be put in truth. He said, there's a gospel here that was committed to him. And yet here's another message he said was committed to more than one person, himself included, but yet some, uh, it apparently was entrusted to others. In fact, look in chapter 1. And he refers there to, uh, in verse... Uh, well, let's read from verse 2, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 2. He says, We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ and the sight of God and our Father, knowing, brethren beloved, your election of God. For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance, as you know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. Now here he's not saying my gospel. He says our. And again, we're dealing with simple words, but our is not singular. Our is plural. Well then if it's obvious to us in this passage then that there is a gospel that is referred to as our gospel that's called the gospel of God and it has to do with proving who Christ is by the resurrection. I don't know if you could read that or not. But it's a, it is a simple truth, but that was the first truth that he preached in the book of Acts. When he came into the synagogues, he didn't come into the synagogues preaching the gospel of Christ immediately to those people. He had to first prove that Jesus Christ was who he was, who he was, that he was the Christ, that God declared him to be so by the resurrection from the dead. And that gospel was preached by more than one person. Uh huh. So the hour is because he was pre the, the 12 apostles were also given that. Truth. Yes. In fact, that word hour, it rather goes pretty, it goes even farther than that. It is a, it, because it is ours because it is Israel's. First of all, really, it, it belongs to Israel. Jesus Christ was Israel's Savior. He came unto His own. He said, I'm not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So the word our pertains to Israel. In other words, it was a message that was to be preached to Israel. It belonged to them. But, the, but you're also correct in that it is ours because He said we were allowed of God to be put in trust with it. That is, it was the message that all the apostles preached. No matter 
who they were, if they weren't preaching that, they weren't an apostle. In fact, the indication is that to be an apostle, the qualification that is given in Acts chapter 1 is, they had to be witness with them of the resurrection. That was what it was about. You, if you didn't witness the resurrection, you were not qualified to be an apostle. And therefore, our gospel was the message of the apostles who were sent to be witnesses of the resurrection. That is the base truth. It's like, I'm sorry for being, I just have to use whatever illustration comes to my mind, but the one that comes to my mind right now is to think about painting a house. And you go and you don't paint each room in the house the same color, but most of the time you will start with a base paint. And then there's pigment that's added to that base. This is the base truth. This is the basic truth that all truth in the New Testament is built upon. If Jesus Christ didn't rise from the dead, forget about it. Forget about believing anything. Just like that Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, if Christ isn't risen from the dead, our faith is vain, our preaching is vain, uh, we're of all men most miserable. So see, that is the base truth the basic truth, and yet we're going to find out, and, and as I think about it, that illustration is probably going to be pretty fit for what I hope to do. But you see there, are, this is the basic truth. And Paul, in his ministry, preached this so that he could build them up to that, you see. If they didn't receive this, we've talked about this before, but if they did not receive this truth, they could not, there was no way they were going to get that one. And it was necessary for him to do things this way. Now, uh, he, he refers there to our entrance in unto them, just for, just for an example. Go to uh, Acts 17. Take Acts 17 in one hand. And take Galatians chapter 1. Acts 17 and Galatians chapter 1. <coughs> And this is amazing that this passage is here in the Scripture because this is the account of his entrance in unto the Thessalonians. <clears throat> I mean, the exact thing that he's referring to. In Acts 17, verse 1, he says, Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul, as his manner was, very significant that it says that this was his manner. And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the Scriptures, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus, whom I preach unto you, is Christ. You notice his entrance in unto them was not immediately preaching to them that Christ had died for their sins. His entrance unto them was, first of all, opening and alleging by the Scriptures that the Christ would have to suffer and rise from the dead. That, in other words, it says in the Scriptures that whoever Christ was going to be, he would suffer and rise from the dead. And he said, okay, now, Jesus of Nazareth, fits those things. In other words, he is that one that was spoken of. So you find him, that's his entrance into them, first of all, preaching that gospel that he said was, was our gospel. Um, look in Galatians 1. We'll be going back to the book of Acts in just a minute. I, I, but uh, in Galatians 1, Notice that what is said there at the end of verse, uh, in chapter 1, verse 20, there at the end of the chapter, Galatians 1, verse 20. And he says, Now the things which I write unto you, behold, before God I lie not. Afterwards I came into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and was unknown by face unto the churches of Judea which were in Christ. But they had heard only that he which persecuted us in times past, now preacheth the faith which once he destroyed. And they glorified God in me. You see, there are people who will go to this passage to say, well, people preached the gospel of Christ before Paul. 
Because after all, it says here that they said, well, he's preaching the faith which once he destroyed. But that's not the, that's not the faith that he once destroyed. This is. In other words, he persecuted people that believed that Jesus was the Christ. That, and that is that word only, <laughs> again, is a small word, but that's a very important word also. That is, up until Paul revealed these things to the apostles, when he, which is what chapter 2 is about, and we'll get to that in just a minute. But up until that point, all that the, the Jews knew that Paul was doing was simply preaching the faith which once he destroyed. And that is what he was preaching in the synagogues. But they did not know that he was revealing something to those that believed in the resurrection, that he was revealing a mystery to them about how, how God was justifying the Gentiles by faith. They had heard that yet. And that was the reason I say that word only is so important. It's like someone says, oh, did you hear what happened today? Oh, there was this terrible accident and this that thing, blah, blah, and all. And, and then you say, well, you know what? I heard about that, but I only heard so much. I didn't hear the rest of the story. In other words, he's saying there, up until a certain point, they had heard only that I was preaching the faith which once I destroyed. They hadn't heard yet that I was preaching something in addition to that, that was hid in that, that was, it was in agreement with it, but it had to be revealed, you see. Well, look in, uh, look in 1 Peter. Take 1 Peter chapter 4. And uh, again, take the book of Acts and go to Acts 2. And we're going to look at some of the things that Peter said. And... One of the reasons that I'm doing this in the context of this study that we've been doing about the Hebrew epistles, you see, a lot of the, a lot of the verses that, the, that people will go to to try to prove that these are the same, uh, that either that we should believe these epistles or that the, the twelve and the people who believe through their ministry, they became members of the church. And they're just trying to add things together. The, a lot of the things that they'll go to are these kinds of passages that we're looking at. They say, well, they believe this, and Pe you know, Peter believed that, Paul believed that, why didn't they? Then they must have all been the same. We're, going, we're trying to make sense of all of these things, see. Now, notice in 1 Peter 4, <coughs> he says in verse 16 there, just a place to start. 1 Peter 4, verse 16. He says, Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? Well, then here we go. We find Peter referring to the gospel of God. You see, just like Paul did. Paul referred to, referred to it, so did Peter. Well, let's look in particular at how he preached it. Go, go to Acts, <clears throat> and we're not going to belabor all of this in Acts 2. We're going to go right straight to the verses, okay? And in Acts 2, from verse 23 there, when Peter preached on the day of Pentecost, in Acts 2, verse 23, he said... Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken, and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. He says God raised him from the dead, and then he's going to say that David has already talked about it. Verse 25, For David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand, that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad. Moreover, also my flesh shall rest in hope, because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. He's quoting out of the 16th Psalm there. That's what that is, you see. So in other words, he's saying, proving by the Old Testament Scriptures 
that God raised Jesus from the dead and that according to the scriptures, that identifies him as the Christ. He said, I will not leave his soul in hell and so forth. We'll come down to verse 36. Now, and before we read verse 36, you understand now what we've just seen in those verses there, verses 23 through 27, that's the gospel of God, right? I mean, God raised him from the dead according to the Old Testament scriptures. Notice what he does, though, from verse 36. Acts 2, verse 36. He says, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart, and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now, I want to show you something here, what, I, what, it, what it is that he just did. Uh, we're going to put this on the board this way, and we're saying there's the beginning of the ministry of John the Baptist, and what you mainly find, you know, in, there in Matthew through John, and it has in there, of course, it, the gospel that was preached is the gospel of the kingdom. Repent and be baptized. Okay. But Israel rejected that message, called for his crucifixion, but like he said there, but God raised him from the dead. So then we come out here, like that's Matthew through John there. So we come out here, the book of Acts... And in the book of Acts, what's preached? This message, that, which is our gospel. The good news that the one you rejected, God raised him from the dead. But what, is Peter, what has Peter done? He has taken this truth. In other words, he, he's preaching our gospel. But he has taken that and added it to that. You know, in other words, he's preaching the resurrection, but then what did he say do? Repent and be baptized. What you've got then is from this combination is the gospel of the circumcision. You see, the gospel of the circumcision differs somewhat from the gospel of the kingdom because the gospel of the kingdom does not include the resurrection. He weren't crucified yet, see? So the gospel of the kingdom that they already... How, what did he do? He just added this that he... That was all he knew to do. That's all he knew to preach. So the, we find Peter and the twelve in the book of Acts preaching the gospel of the circumcision. What is the good... It's the good news of the resurrection, but what's added to it? The the repentance and the, and the baptism of the gospel of the kingdom. So in other words, that truth and that truth added together equals that. Now, that's not that hard. In other words, that is the message that the twelve preach in the book of Acts. Okay? Well, let's come over. And maybe we should do this before we leave here, just to make sure we're on the right track. Look at chapter 3 which is basically a re reiteration of that, tr of that thing, but this is a little bit plainer. He said in verse 19, Acts 3, 19, Repent ye therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out. <clears throat> when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord, and he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive, until the times of restitution of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all His holy prophets since the world began. Then this truth is looking for them to be justified in the future. When He shall come back. When the... Referring to the, pre, the, the presence of the Lord. That is, th those people who heard and believed, repented and were baptized, weren't yet justified. They had to work and endure and keep believing. In other words, th th this is not a message of justification immediately. It is a message of justification that they can have if 
They do certain things, you see. It, is a, it looks forward to the coming of the Lord. It is a forward-looking uh, thing for justification for them. See. Now, go to chapter 13. Acts 13. And notice there with me. Here we find Paul's preaching in, in the synagogue. And we're going to pick up with Paul from verse 23 here. I'm not verse 23, I'm sorry, verse uh, 29. Again, to just get right to the point. Acts 13, verse 29. So when Paul preached that day, he said in verse 29, And when they had fulfilled all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a sepulcher. But God raised him from the dead. And he was seen many days of them which came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are his witnesses unto the people. And we declare unto you glad tidings, how that the promise which was made unto the fathers, God hath fulfilled the same unto us their children, in that he hath raised up Jesus again. As it is also written in the second Psalm, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And as concerning that he raised him up from the dead, now no more to return to corruption, he said on this wise, I will give you the sure mercies of David. Wherefore he saith also in another psalm, Thou shalt not suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Do you see that he's actually using some of the exact same verses that Peter used? He, he, what did Peter do in Acts 2? He went to the psalms, quoted the Psalms, said God has raised him from the dead. What is P Paul doing here? He's preaching that God raised Jesus from the dead and he's going back to the Psalms. Up to this point, it's exactly the same. What is it? It's our gospel. In fact, it says very plainly, look at verse 23 just in case you might miss it. Acts 13 verse 23. Of this man's seed hath God according to his promise raised unto who? Israel. It's our truth, see. Israel's. That was to the Jew first. That, they, they, that was to be preached to them. But what does he do? Come down to verse 38. <clears throat> Acts 13, verse 38. Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins, and by him all that believe are justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. Now that's where it became different. Paul preached that same thing up to that point. But then Paul didn't say, though, repent and be baptized. He didn't take our gospel and add the gospel of the kingdom to it. But he did add something to them there, to that, add something to that truth, which was the essential ingredient of that truth. What was it? Justification already. Therefore, we find Paul's preaching here and what he's doing. What is Paul doing? Well, he's also preaching our gospel, but he adds that essential truth of justification. And what you have him preaching then in here is the gospel of the uncircumcision. Did I write this? You see, in the book of Acts. And so Paul, through this preaching of this combination, those people who believed that truth and then could be established in that truth became part of the, established as the body of Christ. And that was the preaching of the gospel of the uncircumcision in the book of Acts by Paul. And here's the preaching of the, the twelve, which put the, them not in a body, but in a new nation. Now see, all together, here's this church of people, and they all believe in the resurrection. They all believe that Jesus is the Christ, but they're not put in the same calling by the Holy Spirit. And that is the work of the Holy Spirit. It's not like that people, you know, could say, well, uh, be somebody on the street corner and say, well, what you want to be part of? You want to be in the body of Christ or you want to be a, in the nation? It, it wasn't like that. It's like whatever message was presented to you, that was your calling, see? So, and that's why you find there's a certain place in the book of Acts where Paul wanted to go up into Bithynia. 
said, but the Spirit suffered him not. And later on, you find Peter writing to those people. What does that prove? It proves that God had chosen them to be part of the new nation. And so he prohibited Paul from going there. And yet there were other people. He has this dream, and he sees this guy, and he says, come over into Macedonia and help us. Well, that's the way he goes. He, go, he went where the Lord led him because God had people for him to preach to. But it wasn't the same message. Exactly. It had a certain element that was the same. The, remember the paint? The base paint was the same, but the tent was different. This was tinted with that doctrine of justification at the cross, not looking forward to justification in the future by works and holding out and holding on, but just by faith, being justified by Christ's death there, see? So this is how it worked in the book of Acts. And we're, I want you to look now at something with me. Uh, go to, uh, I want you to take two things. Go to 2 Thessalonians 2, 2 Thessalonians 2, and take 2 Corinthians chapter 4. <clears throat> 2 Thessalonians 2 and 2 Corinthians 4. <clears throat> Now, in 2 Thessalonians 2, read with me from verse 13. 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 13, he says, But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth, whereunto he called you by our gospel, to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, Paul's preaching in the book of Acts, those people were called by the preaching of the resurrection. If they, that's how God drew them. It doesn't necessarily say that that was what they heard, and that's, and that's all they heard. But they were drawn by that truth. They were drawn by that preaching, and those that believed it then could hear that you know, and be hear about just, uh, just and be established. Now, I, I personally, you know, I really believe that they were, if they were chosen when they believed in the resurrection, they were justified right then. And when they heard this, they became established, and we could, we could prove that in the Bible. But I'm trying to keep it just as simple as I can, because that's, this is how Paul did it. He began with that, added that, then they're established, see. Notice in 2 Corinthians 4. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 1. He says, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid of them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Do you see what's really being said in there? He's saying, if our gospel be hid, it is hid of them that are lost. If they can't get that, well, he said they have to see that or else lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ should shine unto them. You see, they were called, he said, by that truth. But that was the real message of their salvation, you see. And so, the thing, you know, that people have thought just letting these things be what they are because down through the years, you know, the grace believers have used this passage to say, well, what's the gospel? Well, I don't know. Well, then you're lost. Because <laughs> you don't know what the gospel is, therefore you must be lost. Well, you know, if I talk to somebody and they don't know what the gospel is, there's a good possibility they are lost. But that's not what this passage is in the Bible for. <laughs> 
Now, you know, we can make an application of all things in the Scripture, and maybe there's some, you know, a place where you could use that. But if I'm going to teach it, and I'm going to say, what does it say and what does it mean? That's what it means. That's what it's about. It's about the fact that in the book of Acts, in fact, the, the idea about them that believe not, believe not what? Resurrection. He's blinded the minds of them which believe not in the resurrection. And you, we could say the same thing is true today, really, that if people don't believe in the resurrection, I mean, it, it, you know, it really comes down to the same thing. Even though this truth is not ours, that this isn't, that's what we're going to get to in just a second. And yet, it's about the same thing. It's just that our gospel was about the good news that God had kept His promise to Israel and the fathers. But the one that belongs to us doesn't include them at all. Just hang on. We're going to look at two or three other little things. Go, to, go back again to Galatians just a second. Galatians 2. And notice see how this all got divided out. In Galatians 2, we find this is where Paul went and finally told the apostles this gospel about God justifying the Gentiles. And uh, just read from verse 6 there with me. Galatians 2, verse 6. He says, But of these who seem to be somewhat, whatsoever they were, it maketh no matter to me. God accepteth no man's person. For they who seem to be somewhat in conference added nothing to me. But contrarywise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter. For he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. And when James, Cephas, and John, Cephas is Peter, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship, that we should go unto the heathen, and they unto the circumcision. Now, the reason I'm doing this, when they had that, finally had that meeting, and the twelve heard what Paul was preaching, what did they agree to do? They said, we'll go to the circumcision and you go to the heathen. They did not agree, we'll take your gospel to the circumcision. They did not say, we're going to start believing what you're preaching, Paul. We're going to quit preaching what we're preaching. That is not what they said. They were all, this is what they were preaching. And they said, we're going to keep preaching it, but we're not going to preach it to the Gentiles. And anybody that has preached that gospel there about believe in the resurrection and repent and be baptized is out of the will of God because they made an agreement there that this was the message that God has sent to the Gentiles. So the, this is the, that, that, that's where it got separated out. And, and so there, that was the way it was to the end of the book of Acts. But now I want you to just hang in just a couple other things. We've come all this way. So just, just hang on. Go to Acts 20. And take Ephesians chapter 3. <clears throat> and just uh, once again, just to cut to the chase, as brief as we can. Acts 20, he said in verse 22. Acts 20, verse 22. Paul said, and Now behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there save that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. But none of these things move me, neither account I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy, and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus, to testify the gospel of the grace of God. We had not seen that one yet, now have we? He said, he gets to the end of the book of Acts, he says, I'm going to Jerusalem, and I don't know what's going to happen except the Holy Ghost says bonds and afflictions abide me, but I'm going to go, and I don't count my life dear unto myself to let it be known what the gospel of the grace of God is. Well, look at Ephesians 3. In Ephesians 3, <clears throat> from verse 1 there, we're going to just in fact, kind of skip through the the passage here. Ephesians 3 verse 1. He says, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me to youward, 
Come down to verse 6. That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. He became a prisoner, you see, for saying that this truth that he had been preaching to the people who believed in our gospel. Now, he's going to, he said, I'm, God has sent me with that far hence unto the Gentiles. Is this not fit that this guy should live? So, what, in other words, then by the book of Acts, then, what's the gospel that's preached? He says, it's the gospel of the grace of God. Look, keep a finger there in Ephesians. Look in 1 Timothy. I promise, just a couple other references and we'll stop. 1 Timothy 2. <clears throat> In 1 Timothy 2, he says from verse 3, he says, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men. All men. The man Christ Jesus who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Now in that message, where is the reference to God raising him from the dead according to the Old Testament scriptures? Where is the proof that he's the Christ? That's not part of it, is it? All it is, all this message that's called the gospel of the grace of God is that he said that basic thing that he says is my God. It's justification without that. In other words, the gospel of the grace of God, where, where this truth, I hope you're hanging on, the gospel of the uncircumcision, what was that? It was the preaching of the resurrection plus justification. But now the gospel of the grace of God is justification without it being belonging to the Jews. It's to all. So, you see what we've done with, Paul said, remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel, and he said to rightly divide it. <laughs> the thing, I, I, I feel like a failure here all of a sudden. It's like that the thing that he was to divide was not so much about dividing justification from the gospel of the kingdom. It's not about dividing Christ died from our, for our sins and dividing it from the gospel of the kingdom. It's dividing the truth that Paul said was my gospel, how that Christ had justified men, minus our gospel. Divided from that. In other words, Timothy, you don't have to prove anything to the Jews no more. You don't have to prove that Jesus is the Christ by the resurrection from the dead. You don't have to show anybody that. Just tell them Christ justified them. That he justified everything. He justified them all. That See, that is not the same thing as that gospel. Now, <clears throat> the last thing, look in Ephesians 1. In Ephesians 1, and Paul said from verse 12, that we should be to the praise of His glory who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, you were sealed from that Holy, with that Holy Spirit of promise. Then here's the last little word. There's my, there's our, and there's your. Your gospel, which is that Christ died for all. This truth in the beginning was only revealed to people who believed that one to start with. But when this one was sent to you, see, it became the gospel of the grace of God. Because technically speaking, you should have never heard it. Because according to the Old Testament Scripture, He didn't die for you. Now, I, I, I know, I guarantee you, there's 
people in the world that do not get this. If it was not for Paul's suffering and that revelation that he received when God caught him up and that he became a prisoner for, you could not find your salvation in the Bible. You could not prove to anybody that God saved you. And, I, and it, uh, I've never been able to understand why preachers and teachers resist seeing these differences, that something changed after the book of Acts. And of course, we that believe this truth, the body that we became a part of was not this new nation, because that God was through with that by the end of the book of Acts. But by the cross, He put us together with that body that was already there. That's the one new man. And added us, put us together with them. See? That's the part that we, we were joined. He didn't join this and this together. He joined this and this. The church, the, the twelve and the new nation didn't become part of the body. We did. So words in the Bible are very important. These little words. My gospel, that was the mystery that was hid in the Old Testament scriptures. And Paul could show that in the book of Acts to people who believe that truth because he wasn't preaching that in the book of Acts. He was kept from it until it was time. And now is the time, and before too long, it's going to be up. That's the gospel that saves us today. And that's, I say, again, I don't preach this truth for people today, but Paul certainly did in the book of Acts. Thank you for your patience. I hope this got, you know, was helpful for somebody. And I uh, sure do appreciate y'all being here tonight. <clears throat> We're dismissed.